I want to frame my talk in terms of this. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to speak to this year's PPMD conference. I'm very disappointed not to be in Scottsdale. I had hoped to catch up with a lot of old friends and make new ones. But I appreciate the invitation to talk on this rather broad topic about the Duchenne landscape, understanding where we have come from and how we are moving forward. A few disclosures. I want to frame my talk in terms of this timeline, which I borrowed or more, uh, more candidly, I guess I stole from uh, or my friend and colleague, Dong Shen Duan. He published it in a review regarding the development of AAV gene therapies. But it's a nice framework for thinking about Duchenne dystrophy in general, beginning, of course, with Dr. Duchenne himself. This is a photograph of him in the days when he wandered from hospital to hospital in Paris, stimulating uh, nerves of the face with uh, phoretic uh, electricity uh, in order to, to tease out the neurology of emotions. But in 1868, he published a monograph describing what we now know to be B. Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Particularly, he described the muscle pathology associated with it, the degree of fat and fibrosis that occurs in muscle, and what we call dystrophic change. And he described a syndrome that we still know today. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a disease with onset of around age three to five years old, often presenting at that time with pelvic girdle weakness seen as difficulty arising from the floor or tight heel cords, a serum creatine kinase of 50 to 100 times normal, and then the age of before steroids really associated with uh, loss of ambulation around the age of 12. Dr. Becker, who we won't speak about much today, described Becker muscular dystrophy, also an X-linked disorder. Becker muscular dystrophy, we sometimes use a definition in the older days, a definition of loss of ambulation after age of 12, but a more helpful one would be after the age of 15. Although Becker muscular dystrophy really encompasses all disorders of the dystrophin gene that cause things like limb girdle syndromes in adulthood, muscle ache syndromes, and even isolated cardiomyopathy syndromes. There are two take home messages that are important in looking at a list like this. The first is that treatment in the modern era treatment, particularly with steroids has changed the natural history of these syndromes. So we know of people who've walked many years longer than their uncles did, or that, uh, we, that we might've expected of them because they are, were treated at an early age with steroids. And they're still Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but treated Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And more importantly, perhaps, is that the dystrophinopathies are a continuum of disorders. These terms mean something to us clinically and mean something to you as parents. If we say someone looks like a typical Duchenne or a moderately severe Becker, it means something, but they're all related to problems in the dystrophin gene. There really wasn't much published after 1868 for a very long time until really a critical paper in 1974, the first paper that looked at prednisone in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, that looked at a group of patients and showed some improvement with the use of prednisone. This first inkling of its utility was supported really proven, I would say, by papers in 1987 and 1989 from the Clinical Investigation in Duchenne Dystrophy Group. Here, a randomized double-blind six-month trial that showed Duchenne muscular dystrophy was improved by steroids. And now, now so nearly 30 plus years later, we know from multiple studies that the use of corticosteroids can prolong ambulation by up to two to five years and reduces the need for spinal stabilization surgery, improves cardiac function, pulmonary function, delays the need for non-invasive ventilation, and increases survival and quality of life in patients. So the key to any of these new therapies we're talking about doesn't get rid of the need for uh, steroid therapies. That's really quite important. The next big landscape and uh, big milestones were the discovery of the dystrophin gene in 1987 and the discovery of truncated dystrophin, internally truncated dystrophin as causes of Duchenne versus Becker muscular dystrophy. This gene, most parents and most people at this meeting are very familiar with. The gene is listed here on top uh, and under A. There are 79 pieces or exons that have to be spliced together into one final messenger RNA. Here drawn with multiple arrows because multiple different promoters can make different isoforms and different tissues. But this M isoform, the 427 uh, M isoform is the one we really acknowledge as the muscle predominant isoform. And that muscle uh, isoform is then uh, is, uh, 
put into a, uh, um, sorry, I'm turning on a, a highlighter here, forms the, encodes the protein, which has at the end terminus, the amino terminus binds to dystroph, uh, binds to the actin binding domain with a large, um, uh, binds to filamentous actin in muscle and a large central rod domain and a C terminal domain that binds to dystroph lichen. We use these terms regularly, N terminus, rod domain, and C terminus. A, a really simplified cartoon of this structure is shown here, showing binding at one end to actin, the other end to distro, uh, via a whole complex to dystroph lichen and anchoring the muscle. So there's stabilization of force. And in the absence of dystrophin, there is none of this anchorage and we know that muscle deteriorates and muscle degeneration occurs. Now, Becker muscular dystrophy is associated with a partially functional protein. And that partially functional protein best easiest demonstrated, let's say by the missing rod domain portion, some portion of the rod domain. There's still a shortened version of the rod domain. So there's partial function. So we get partially, uh, we, we have a slower process of degeneration and regeneration. This is the concept of Duchenne versus Becker muscular dystrophy. Now, there are quite a few mutations associated with, uh, this, uh, with these syndromes. This is a distribution of DMD mutations among over 1,100 patients that we published some years ago. In this group, there's a, there's a lower than usual representation of deletion mutations. They usually account for about two thirds of mutations, but all of these different types, deletion, stop codon mutations, um, missense, uh, uh, frame shifting mutations within an exon, uh, exon duplications, all of these occur. I'm going to come back to this group about exon duplications. About 11% of patients are exon duplications, somewhere between 6 and 11% in different databases, because I'm going to return at the end of this talk to an exciting new result we have in duplication patients. But the difference in predicting Duchenne versus Becker really, Becker is really this reading framework out of frame mutations that completely interrupt creation of dystrophin protein are associated with DMD, but in frame mutations, those that preserve an open reading frame and allow translation of a partially functional protein cause Becker muscular dystrophy. We all know that rule and reports come out from, clinic, uh, from uh, clinical testing uh, labs that say in or out of frame, and it holds up about 90% of the time for DMD. Although I'm gonna point out that about 50% of the people with um, Becker muscular dystrophy actually have out of frame mutations when we look at their blood. We have to look at the muscle messenger RNA to really understand whether it's in or out of frame. So it's a reminder to all parents that there is not a perfect concordance between these predictions and what we see in patients. Another reminder about Becker muscular dystrophy, I mentioned that some people are more affected. There's children, who, there's young men who stop walking at 20 and there's uh, older men who stop walking at 40 and men who stop walking at 60, all have Becker muscular dystrophy. And that's because there are many different Becker type in-frame uh, dystrophin proteins. Here you see some examples of different size Becker ones. And it's not the amount of protein that determines everything. This is about 140%. This is about 15% of dystrophin. Yet this patient went off his feet at about 70 years of age. And this one in his mid twenties. And that tells us that the amount of dystrophin alone is not sufficient to predict the outcome. Another key thing when thinking about uh, muscular dystrophy diagnoses is that there is still incompleteness of clinical uh, genomic DNA tests. Those are tests from blood. I'm gonna just show uh, an example uh, from a recent publication we put out just this year, which a patient was said to have an exon 45 deletion based on the clinical test he had performed. And in fact, he actually had an in-frame pseudo-exon mutation. That is, the, the method that the test was performed with suggested all of X45 was absent, but in fact, part of exon 45 was there and another part of the intron 45 was included and interpreted as a sort of exon. Why is this important? Well, he actually had an in-frame mutation. So if he went, say, for exon 44 skipping, it would have made him worse. Or if this patient had been enrolled, let's say, in a clinical trial of microdystrophin, he was actually doing very well because of this in-frame pseudoexon mutation. He would have been misinterpreted as having a therapeutic benefit. And such mutations actually are not uncommon. They might account for around 5% of them or Every patient who has a, an excellent family history of disease whom we've been able to get muscle from, we found such mutations deep within the intron. 
this signal here, SD says splice donor site. What this represents is defining a new fake intron or, or fake exon or pseudo exon with deep within the intron uh, that is incorporated in the messenger RNA. And whether this causes Duchenne or Becker muscular dystrophy really depends on whether the reading frame is preserved by these pseudo exons. Well, we've reported quite a new, quite a few of these. So this is really a reminder that in a certain number of patients, muscle biopsy still plays a significant clinical role. One other thing about muscle biopsy while we're on the topic, it's important to know that low levels of dystrophin can still greatly alter the phenotype, the clinical features. This is a terribly complicated slide, but really if we look at it over here, there's a seven-year-old boy who presented to the clinic with a diagnosis of DMD because his mutation report said that he had a nonsense mutation in exon 42. And it turns out that if you exclude exon 42, you maintain an open reading frame. If you skip exon 42, you could have a Becker-like protein. That's what that says. When we saw him around age 10, he actually did much better than most boys with Duchenne at that age. And in fact, as an example of how he was at age 14, he, he could still play baseball. He batted, he couldn't run well, so he had a pinch runner, but he played baseball. And when we looked at the muscle, what we actually found was that this nonsense mutation, as it was described in the test report from the clinical laboratory, actually altered splicing of exon 42. This is a complicated diagram of the exons 42 splicing pattern. But this is, in fact, what this represents is a fair number, a proportion of, of uh, his um, messenger RNA skipped exon 42 entirely. This actually caused two other potential sites for skipping. But it, the, the, the take home message from this is that this amount, skipping of exon 42, represented only about six to 10% of his gene. Only six to 10% of his transcripts were in frame. And that was sufficient to make about 3% of dystrophin. So it's actually 3.2% of dystrophin by this measure. And that low level of dystrophin, 3.2% percent of dystrophin, it was sufficient enough to allow him to stay still ambulant and very active at age 14. In fact, he's 16. I saw him in clinic a few weeks ago, and he still uh, goes up to the plate uh, on different occasions. So that's to remind us that there is still a place for muscle biopsy in understanding exactly what's going on in the muscle, and also avoiding enrolling patients in trials where they might confound the results of those trials. Probably the next big thing in our timeline of Duchenne muscular dystrophy was the uh, paper that showed uh, the effect of Teplerson and then its approval in 2017, the Teplerson for treatment of exon uh, 51 skippable Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And so what is exon skipping? Well, it reverts again to this idea of, of uh, uh, the reading frame rule. In a patient who's missing here, exon B, let's say, where there's an out of frame deletion, uh, I'm sorry, exon A, where there's an out of frame deletion and that shifts the reading frame. And remember, the genetic code is read in groups of three. So here, exon uh, A is deleted, and we can see that things are shifted. If we can make a bigger deletion, if we can skip one more exon, we can restore the reading frame and make the equivalent in this model, the analog of the uh, Becker muscular dystrophy messenger RNA. How do we do that? Well, we use a small fragment of. of uh, what's called an antisense oligonucleotide, something that matches up to the exon definition element. In this case, it's exon 52 skipping we're demonstrating. But exon 252 skipping gets rid of the, hides exon 52 from the mature messenger RNA, resulting in expression of dystrophin. And in fact, I'll point out that there are, in fact, now four such therapies that have been approved in the United States for skipping of exon 45, exon 51, and 53. So there are choices for these therapies, each of which has been shown and approved by the FDA to have an impact on disease um, progression right, or on dystrophin expression. What about just putting the gene in? Well, that's been tried, the full-length gene. One of the challenges for putting the full-length gene is its size. About 11 and a half thousand nucleotides form the gene. I always like to remind people that this has been tried, although this was not a highly successful experiment. But all the way back in 2004, there's a publication that shows you could just see here 
21 days after injection of naked plasma DNA, just raw DNA, there was a little uptake of it, but nowhere near the kind of efficiency we need. So what is all our, our alternative if we can't just direct uh, inject uh, DNA? The alternative is to use a virus called adeno-associated virus or AAV. And that's what this whole timeline is really about. It shows milestones in the pathway about the discovery and experimentation with AAV. But for our purposes, for thinking about them therapeutically, I think it's safe to say that the landmark paper in AAV really began with this, where the, in the disease spinal muscular atrophy, systemic AAV carrying the missing gene SMN was shown to be highly, highly successful in, in preserving life of patients with SMN, a, a, a very devastating disorder that results in essentially 100% of children either dead or on a ventilator by two years of age. But this showed safety of systemic delivery, showed the ability to be able to use it for neuromuscular disease. It was followed closely by the first delivery of what are called microdystrophins in DMD patients. And many patients, many parents at this meeting are very familiar with microdystrophins. And you will hear much more about microdystrophins uh, during, the, during the course of this meeting. Uh, there are multiple companies now with microdystrophin trials. But microdystrophins are, well, because we cannot fit the full length gene into the adeno-associated virus, that's the limitation of the adeno-associated virus. I should go back and just mention adeno-associated viruses come in different flavors or capsids. And those adeno-associated viruses um, uh, have propensity to go into different tissues. So uh, their limitation is you can only fit about 5,000 nucleotides in them instead of 11 and a half like we need for dystrophin. So we can't fit the full length dystrophin. Instead, we have to take out pieces of it. And a variety of different uh, versions of microdystrophins have been developed. These are representations showing here the N terminal domain, the C terminal domain, and then what we see as uh, these repeat elements within the central rod domain. These repeats one through 24 with a couple of hinge regions in here as well. So three such different versions are now in clinical trials from different companies. Here's a, these are represented from uh, uh, with the ones from Solid and Sarepta and Pfizer. And I'll show you some results, just some publicly presented or peer reviewed results published with one of them, the Sarepta product. My colleague, Dr. Jerry Mandel has shown expression following delivery of this systemically. We give doses in what are called vector genomes per kilogram. So two times 10 to the 14th vector genomes per kilogram uh, of a microdystrophin uh, in a virus uh, capsid called RH74. And following uh, gene delivery, you can detect expression of microdystrophin at really quite reasonable levels in patients um, with, uh, who didn't have it in their pre-biopsy. And one of the things is, although we know that these microdystrophins are protective in mice, we don't yet know for sure how protective they will be in humans. That's what the trials are determining, but certainly there's great promise in this and a lot of excitement about it. There are challenges with using AAV, and among those challenges are immunity to the capsid. So these are pre-existing immunities to AAVs that can be acquired in the, in the, uh, in the environment. These uh, can interfere with the efficiency of transfection into the target tissue. Uh, so trials require absence of antibodies prior to gene transfer. It's worth noting too, they, they are definitely acquired by treatment with the AAV vector. So right now we think retreatment is a one, or that treatment is a one-time thing, where we don't think retreatment is a possibility. Although in the future, it quite, it's quite likely that retreatment will, uh, will be uh, a possibility as multiple groups are studying ways around these challenges. An additional problem is immunity to the transgene. Boys who haven't been expressing dystrophin now express a novel protein. And it's, it, the body can recognize that novel protein, or at least has a possibility to recognize that novel protein as non-self, to consider it a new antigen, as we say, and to result in, in immune responses against that. That could result in illness and adverse events, and it could diminish long-term efficacy of gene therapy. And in fact, in one of the uh, one of the interesting recent initiatives uh, among the academic community in partnership with the companies running gene therapy trials, there's been a pretty fair exchange or open exchange of some of the data about some of the illness and adverse events. 
and su suggesting coming to a consensus that there may be particular regions of the microdystrophin gene that can induce these kind of responses in patients um, if those patients don't carry those exons in their own uh, DMD gene. And that's why some gene, that's why gene therapy trials right now are uh, containing some exclusionary criteria for people with mutations in certain regions of the gene. But I, I think uh, each of the companies I mentioned are to be applauded for sharing information rather openly with uh, the research community and patient community about what those, uh, what those results are. But this remains a challenge and one that needs to be addressed. And certainly these well-designed trials that are underway from each of these companies uh, are likely to give us really good ideas about the safety and efficacy of this. So I wanna mention one other AAV-based therapy and I wanna add one more uh, date to the timeline here, and that's 2022, because I'm going to share some data showing the first demonstration of restoration of full-length dystrophin expression in a DMD patient. And this story actually begins a little afield from where we're going to wind up. It begins really with an observation we found in trying to explore why some patients didn't look as severe as they should have. So this was an example of a patient with a nonsense mutation in exon 1 and a nonsense mutation we would expect that patients make no dystrophin whatsoever and would be severely affected. But this uh, gentleman who uh, I, I met in, in late adulthood, in his late adulthood, was in a wheelchair full-time about 70 years of age, and he died about 77 years of age. And when we did a muscle biopsy, we saw that there was about 15% levels of dystrophin of a slightly smaller size. So whatever this amount of dystrophin is, whatever this version of dystrophin is, it's highly protective. And we had a sense that it's even more highly protective than he let on because we found multiple other families that were not known to be related. All of them had boys who came to attention because they had symptoms only of elevated serum CK, sometimes with some muscle aches. But we, they turned out to all be related by an unknown ancestor quite far back, but we proved that genetically. And we, uh, they demonstrated really what was consistent with what we call alternate translational initiation within exon six, leading to a, size, a diminished size protein of about 413 rather than 417 kilodaltons, the units we measure size in. And we postulated and then proved that this is due to what we call an internal ribosome entry site within DMD exon five. An internal ribosome entry site is a mechanism by which the ribosomes can assemble in an unusual way, an alternate way to how they usually do it, someplace downstream in a gene and still start translation. And in our paper published in 2014, in which we showed the function of this, we pointed out a couple of things. One is that iris existed in exon five and the start place, the start uh, translation initiation site existed in exon six in patients, both patients with exon two duplications and patients with exon two deletions. Both of those patients had a frame shift of the reading frame. Both of them should stop making the protein. But duplication two patients, uh, they, they look like DMD. In fact, they're the most common DMD duplication. They account for about 10% of all duplications. In contrast, patients with deletions of exon 2 had not been described at the time of our, of our paper. And we studied why this might be. We put it into an assay. The exact details of the assay aren't important except to say what I'm showing you here. This is the measure of iris activity. This is the iris activity of exon 5 of DMD. And we could see when we had a duplication present in this assay, the iris activity disappeared. And when we had a deletion of exon 2, the iris activity was there. So we postulated there were patients out there in whom exon 2 was deleted, and we just didn't see them in our databases. And my colleague, Alessandra Ferlina in Italy, in fact, turned up such a patient who uh, showed the same sort of size shift, the same diminished dystrophin, but really was rather asymptomatic. So this tells us that the iris is active if we've uh, uh, we got a deletion of the uh, exon 2, but not if we have a duplication of exon 2. Well, why do we care about this? This is now a great target for a therapy to skip exon 2, because if we skip one copy of exon 2, we have entirely normal wild type dystrophin. And if we skip both copies, we make use of the form that that gentleman had who walked to age 70. How do we do the skipping? We use something called a U7 small nuclear RNA. This is a gene that's never turned into a protein. It's a small nuclear RNA. It has a role, its normal role is stabilizing what we call the histone pre-mRNA, 
It binds there via a site called the HDE binding site. What we can do is swap out the HDE binding site with an antisense that's directed at an exon of interest, whatever exon we want in the exon of interest. So we targeted the exon appropriately. Now it, it interferes with the, the assembly of the spliceosome, but it, it, it's not translated into a protein. That's useful. So we put it into a vector with four complete copies, two in which we target the splice acceptor and two in which we target the splice donor site. And in fact, we show and have published in peer reviewed data all of the data that support the safety of this. We showed the absence of any off target splicing variation uh, with this vector using a really unbiased approach. We looked at all the splicing every place in the human spliceosome, as it's called, or transcriptome. Um, and we looked in non-human primates and we saw no toxicity associated with it. So these were all supportive of the idea of moving ahead. And we showed in mouse studies, we could establish a dose we thought worked. This is a representation I'll show you again. So I'll take just a moment to describe it. We can see three bands in each of these here where we see wild, uh, we see, I'm sorry, a duplication band at the top, wild type with, no, with only a single copy of exon two in the middle and at the bottom, a deletion exon two band. We can represent this as wild type or deletion out of a proportion of all the, the mRNA that we have. So we consider both of these to be therapeutic. One makes normal protein and one makes that iris driven form. So we can show a dose response to that. And when we look at protein, we can see that there is in fact an increase in dystrophin expression here as we go across. This is what we keep, I should call a heat map to say, how positive is the fiber? What percentage of the fiber is there? So 100% of the circumference expressing this red. But you can see with your own eyes the dystrophin expression. So we established a dose that we thought would work, 3e e to the 13. And that led to this first in human trial, led to my colleague, Dr. Waldrop, because I have a royalty interest in this approach. She led the trial. And everything I'm going to show you is done under terms of a conflict management plan. Uh, I'll show you where things were done outside of the NCH institution as well. So in this trial, the first in human trial, the first two patients were enrolled at the request of the FDA above eight years of age. So an 8.9 year old boy of about 23 kilograms who tolerated the infusion quite well. And the second boy was about 13.7 years of age at 58 kilograms, much bigger. He tolerated the infusion quite well as well. We only had enough virus left for an infant. And in fact, an infant showed up, a seven, uh, we saw him at five months of age, but uh, we were able to speak to the FDA and treat him at seven months of age. He also tolerated very well. So he's the youngest patient to my, to my knowledge that's treated systemically with the vector for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now, a couple of interesting things. All of the parents in the audience will know that um, serum CK is not a very useful test. Uh, until, it's, until it is useful because it varies so much with activity. We could see a nice drop of it though to the level of 560, which we just never see, or 500, which we never see in boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Perhaps more informative is what happened in the boy with, um, with uh, the infant who, who can't account for activity. This isn't because he was at a, a birthday party or anything, but his dropped all the way down from 14,000 to about 500, still remains low at six months and about 1,000. This is the 100 meter walk time, which improved a little bit in the first boy, went down a little bit in the second boy, and difficulty in climate forced years continued to worsen in the second boy, who's now 15 and a half years old, but I'll note that he still remains ambulant. We could see from our measure of skipping, what we see exon skipping, the same representation, we could get wild type and del2 skipping, but not tons of it, about 20% is the highest level and about 8% of the highest level in the older boy. So we were unprepared for what we saw with the infant study. And the infant, we saw 100% skipping. In fact, this was somewhat unbelievable because it was so good. It was repeated and was actually um, uh, confirmed. And it goes along with what we see with the protein. When we look at the protein, this is a Western blot and it's a very busy blot, a little misordered because it was all run blindly by Dr. Mike Lawler at the message, at the, uh, Medical College of Wisconsin. And if you look down here, you can see the results of these blots that in the first patient, the nine-year-old patient, uh, we could see that we got up to about 6% of dystrophin expression. Um, it varies a little bit, not because it changes over time, but probably because we sample muscles somewhat differently. So around 6% of levels of dystrophin, here seven, here six. And in the second patient, we could have a slight measurable increase, but not an enormous one to about one and a half. 
In contrast, in the infant, we see levels of 70%. It's the mean of two values, 59 and 81. That's 70% levels of dystrophin expression. This is really quite extraordinary amounts. More striking, perhaps, is the distribution. This is a representation in the first boy who had about 6% of normal levels. He had between uh, 26 and 64% of fibers that were positive, actually at 12 months. In that same sample was 44%. So there was significant amounts of dystrophin expression. In the older boy, consistent with the Western blot, he had about 6% levels. But in the infant, we can see here, he actually has 99% of fibers that express dystrophin. So 99% of fibers expressing dystrophin at a total of about 70% of the levels by Western blot. And this is the, an antibody we use to distinguish full length versus the iris-driven form. And we can see that there is robust and widespread full length staining all the way across the sample. Um, uh, we haven't quantified it quite the same way because we haven't validated that test yet, but we will. So what explains the differential effect? Why is it different in younger versus older participants? What can we anticipate regarding durability? Just two comments on that. We're not sure about the difference in younger versus older. There's difference in fibrosis as people get older. This is what we typically see. The oldest patient didn't have such fibrosis though in his muscle. This was in, uh, in a gastric nemus muscle, calf muscle. Uh, but he didn't have much muscle elsewhere as targets as, as well. But it could be because there's differences in maturity of muscle, for example. What about durability? Well, we'll have to see the durability. We're about to biopsy this patient for a second time in the coming month. But this is a marker of muscle fiber regeneration. Regeneration is not a good thing in Duchenne muscle in the sense that it always marks past degeneration. So this is a marker of ongoing degeneration. But we can see that with treatment, we really almost completely get rid of this degenerative process in muscle. So that probably means that this is going to be protected. These muscle fibers are going to be protected for a very long time, and they won't lose the vector genomes that are in there. We will have to see, though. But we can say that in the youngest boy treated to date with this, we have uh, robust expression of apparently full of dystrophin, and um, uh, uh, there's no significant treatment-related adverse events, and we need to do further studies to address the durability. Now I'm supposed to look forward and I've left a lot of things undone in the interest of time. Where else are we going? Well, there's enormous interest in genome editing to restore full length dystrophin expression is one possibility. Ways to put in the dystrophin expression to help us uh, to restore it using some approaches from CRISPR-Cas9 editing. Another one is to sort of permanently induce exon skipping to excision, to excise an exon or to uh, mutate splicing signals for an exon. There's a lot of interest and there will be in the coming years in non-viral gene delivery, including because among other things, you can deliver full length dystrophin uh, if you can efficiently get uh, non-viral delivery in the muscle fibers. And as we can also use it for ed delivering gene editing and elements as well. There's uh, really very interesting data on new AAV vectors that are better tra transfection, that provide better for transfection of muscle. And that's gonna be a real movement in the coming years. We'll hear more about. And finally, we're gonna be talking more about bespoke or personalized therapies. Those are therapies that are individualized to an individual patient. They have challenges for funding and challenges for bringing to, um, bringing to an individual. Uh, but we wanna point out that the NIH and FDA are very supportive of these approaches right now, or at least have, have signaled that they'll be willing to consider them uh, right now. So with that, I'm gonna close. I wanna thank a few people for the data of our own that I showed you, particularly my colleague, Megan Waldrop, who runs the trial, Dr. Nicola Wen, my former postdoc, who now runs a laboratory at Nationwide Children's Hospital, my former postdoc, uh, Adeline Villen, and um, Tabitha Simmons, uh, whose thesis work made up some of the data I showed you, and uh, Tanya Vetter, who really has helped, uh, um, uh, helped us in establishing quantification methodology that we think is robust and reproducible and uh, uh, is available for anyone who was interested in it. I want to thank as well our group of neuromuscular uh, outcomes measure specialists without whom we couldn't do this work and Michael Lawler, the Medical College of Wisconsin, um, uh, who did all of the quantification. So thank you very much and I look forward to any questions.
Thanks to Kevin, and I think he is online now. If someone has a question or two for Kevin, please come to the mics on the side. As you can see, the takeaways from this is genetics is pretty complicated. Um, some, of that dis <laughs> some of that discussion was a little, uh, more than a little over my head. Hello, Kevin. We are grateful for what you're doing. I hope you're feeling good. And, and the results of the U7 Dup2 in that baby is astounding. And for all of us who've hung our hearts on CKs, to see a CK that drops from 14,000 to 500 would be a miracle that we'd all like to see. So thank you. Anyone have questions for Kevin? All right. Hi, Dr. Flanagan. Uh, my question is uh, rather like a selfish one. Uh, my son uh, has a duplication of exon 8 and 9, and I believe in US it is the second most common duplication. Uh, I think, uh, I believe, like, if you skip exon 8, 9 tends to skip together with 8. So do you think it's possible that, you know, in near future we could see targeting other exons since you're seeing good, such good results with uh, exon 2 uh, duplication? Right, I think that's a terrific question. Um, uh, so the, the short answer is yes, we're very interested in many other exons and in our laboratory, in fact, have developed vectors highlighting many other exons and in fact, pseudo exons as well. Eight and nine is one that we've looked at and you're absolutely correct, they tend to, they tend to uh, uh, not always, but have a tendency to be spliced out together, something we call co-splicing. Co um, one of the cautions we have to have is we, we don't want to overskip in the setting of, uh, of mutations where we don't have this rescue of the iris element. But, um, you know, I think we, we've, we can see just from our, our limited data that we have, uh, we, are, we have one extreme in the infant and the other extreme in the older boys. So it's going to be quite likely that we can titrate to be able to skip to get a large degree of normal wild type dystrophin in patients. We, we've actually demonstrated this, myself and my colleague, Dr. Wen, in cell lines from patients with single and double exon duplications, several examples of them. Uh, we, it gets more challenging to do uh, when we get up to larger duplications. So we're really concentrating on single exon duplications or double exon duplications but I definitely think it has potential as a route forward. Great. Sorry, one more. Uh, you mentioned about the iris activity and the specific, like, how it happened that, you know, for Exxon 2, it worked out with, with this, this specific thing. Do you think that it's, it's possible that there are other similar activities and maybe some other exons that have not been discovered yet or, uh, like, similar? That's mechanisms? also a, gr a, a great question. We know of some alternate translational initiation that occurs in the gene. For example, there's a common mutation called three. It's a deletion of exons three through seven. And we know that some, some boys who carry that look like typical Duchenne and some boys look like, um, like Becker muscular dystrophy. And it's been determined that part of that has to do with translational initiation beginning within exon eight. What we don't understand is the control uh, of that altered translation initiation in that example. And there's reason to suspect that there's in some, uh, that in dystrophin, it's, uh, there are some examples where translation can begin in exon 10 as well. But uh, the iris is the only element that's been clearly defined as a control element for initiating that. Uh, so uh, there's not a full, we don't have a full understanding of all the mechanisms, but I don't think we've exhausted the idea of alternate translational initiation as a therapy for different mutations. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kevin. Another question? Yeah, um, Kevin, Seth Perlman from Seattle Children's. Um, this is, it, I mean, really incredible results that you're showing with these three patients. And as you point out, exon 2 duplications um, are relatively common and the most common duplication. Speaking somewhat selfishly just for our center and patient population where I have a few families that have been following your work there very closely, what are the next steps with this therapy specifically and what's the timeline look like for that? Sure. So I'll, I'll say that this technology had been licensed to a, uh, to a dentist that then became Astellas. Astellas recently uh, is in the process of returning the license of this to us. Um, they had designed, uh, I, I think it's, I can say, um, uh, they uh, wanted to redesign both 
the vector uh, and uh, as a whole uh, and the uh, transgene package for commercial reasons in my book, not necessarily scientific reasons. Um, and none of that preclinical development equaled what we saw. So what I have presented to you is not what Estellas was trying to actually develop, but was instead what I presented to you was our own work, our own IND. We hold the IND. Um, we uh, developed the uh, the vector, the production of the vector with, fund, with foundation funding. So right now we're looking for an appropriate partner to carry this forward in order to make new, new vector uh, based on our design. And we're looking for partners, whether those are commercial partners or whether those are foundation partners. Uh, clearly, our data suggests that we should treat more infants at this existing dose. And clearly our data suggests that in the older group, the larger groups, let's say above eight, we should do the dose escalation that we had originally planned in the design of the study. And for boys who are in between infancy and age eight, what we would anticipate is we would need to treat some at the, what we would consider this infant dose and consider that dose escalation might be necessary. We're hamstrung at the moment that we don't have virus on the shelf. And, uh, uh, that's um, that's so we're we're currently looking and engaging with with uh, all sorts of partners, uh, both larger pharma companies and smaller pharma companies, and we'll soon be coming to foundations like the Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, um, looking for funds to develop enough uh, vector to treat uh, another number of patients on the order of fifteen to twenty more patients. That's an expensive enterprise to do. Uh, but I think our data is really stunning in the sense we have no other example of restoration of full link dystrophin to 99% of fiber. So um, we really need to find a way to move this forward really quite quickly. Yeah, thank you. I, I hope that you find that way pretty soon. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin, I'm, I, I'm hopeful and believe that you will find people. So what would be your timeline as time is the commodity for all of these patients? If and when you sign that partner, how fast can you be up and running? Uh, Pat, that sort of depends on a few different things. If we had found, I'm, 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 I'm not making a pitch to Parent Project right now, I want to be clear about that, but if we had a- Well, you can anyway, philanthropic, but never mind. Right, right, if we had a philanthropic partner today, we would initiate a contract to make the first, the, 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 the um, sort of the reagents that go into the virus, the plasmids, the necessary plasmids, we would initiate that uh, immediately and we would book the, the production of this in the same facility where we produced it before. It would take us about a year to make more of that. If this goes to a partner who has a significantly different manufacturing process um, and their own different timelines, it, it might take longer than that. It might take two years to two and a half years, depending on what those changes are and what the FDA requires us for comparative studies between the groups. Um, so it, it really, really depends. Some of those partners have scale uh, for manufacturing that um, uh, could accelerate things down the road. So there's reason to think about both approaches. Um, this is all, the data that I've shown you is quite new. The data I've shown you is uh, in fact less than eight, eight weeks old. Um, as is the news that we're, that, we're, that we're now looking for a new partner. Both of those things are new sets of data. Um, but the quickest route is if we had a partner who would allow us to uh, simply re repeat the manufacturing in the same sort of approach we did before and to do so quickly and get in the, that queue for that immediately. Well, that would be amazing. And um, a year feels like a long time, but shortest path to treatment would be um, ideal. One last question for you, Kevin. And then we'll let you go. And, and again, I hope you're, you're feeling all right and appreciate your being here today. Um, I, I think in, in the world of Duchenne, as, as companies have amended their protocol to eliminate the 1 to 17, I think there are loads of questions in this audience about what, what would be your view of how can we think about treating them? Can we think about treating them? And what's, what in your head would be a timeline for us to get, get over some of the challenges that occur in those first exons? Right, well, a, a, a couple of thoughts. First, by the way, thanks for your well wishes. I wanna say how disappointed I am that I can't be there. As you know, Pat, I really always love to attend the PPMD and I was hoping to really um, to really uh, catch up with a lot of people there. So, and I congratulate you on what looks like a great meeting. Um, for, for mutations at this end of the gene, I, I, I wanna point out that um, we, we do have evidence 
uh, in spaced and cell lines that this same approach of throwing exon 2, skipping exon 2 to throw the mutation, uh, throw the, the transcript out of frame, may in fact allow transcription from the iris-driven uh, exon 6 point uh, in, uh, in other patients with mutations before exon 5. So if we take all of that, those are studies that have been done in cell lines. Um, some families probably in your audience have been kind enough to give us cell lines to do those studies. Um, in those, in that category of patients that we would not expect the same sort of uh, recognition of nonsense that we did with deletion mutations, for example, in the first portion of the gene. So um, because of that, we think this route of therapy might actually be amenable to treating about 5% of all mutations. I'll point out that there are other approaches underway to treat mutations in exons one through, uh, one through 17, in fact, one through 19. We presented work uh, publicly at the American Society of Gene Cell Therapy, for example, to look at um, genome editing approaches that restore, uh, that potentially can restore dystrophin expression uh, for anyone with a mutation in the region from one through 19. Right now, the efficiency of that is relatively low, better in the heart than in skeletal muscle, but it's something we'll carry, we will carry forward. Finally, I'll point out that you know, there's a lot of work going on um, in the community. And again, something I think we should be thankful to the companies doing gene therapy studies on right now for sharing data um, about the adverse events that appear to have occurred with some patients with mutations in, the, in, the, in, the, in that region of the gene who've been in, in uh, gene therapy trials. Um, there's a, a lot of thought uh, underway to thinking about how to abrogate that response, how to avoid it entirely or minimize the chance of it by pretreatment regimens. And I do fully expect that uh, we will see uh, after the first round of gene therapy, um, microdystrophin gene therapy studies, each of these, each of the community as a whole will be moving toward therapies that might, uh, or therapeutic trials that might condition uh, uh, patients to avoid having those, those, uh, uh, those immune responses, particularly the, the T cell responses that might be particularly detrimental. Well, that would be um, terrific, Kevin. And I can't thank you enough for what you're doing. And hopefully this community will rally around and provide enough resources for you to really move rapidly. So thank you. Take good care of yourself. And we'll put you, you down for next year, for sure. I'll count on it. We'll thank see you. you soon. Bye -bye.